Hello and welcome to my screencast. My name is Derek Tafuma. Um, I, this might be a long one. So I've been going through an article which was in Bloomberg, and this is the article. Obviously, I've made a few changes to it. Now, this article was really interesting to me, so I decided, you know what, I'm going to talk about it. All right. So here is the thing. Uh, it talks about why Africa is not rising, and there are some valid points here which I had not really looked at before. So this article was uh, written in December 2015 by James uh, Gibney, and if you go to James. Uh, Gibney, he, he writes editorials on international affairs for Bloomberg's View. He was featured as editor at the Atlantic, deputy editor at the New York Times, op-ed page and executive editor at Foreign Policy Magazine. He was a foreign service officer and a speechwriter for Secretary of State Warren Christopher, National Security Advisor Anthony Lake and President Bill Clinton. So what you will notice is some of these guys who are writing books have actually, they are writing about things which they know firsthand, things which have happened uh, under their watch. I'm reminded of uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, which is a book which was written by another author who has been working for the NSA. Now, I wonder, uh, if these guys are cleared to to write uh, these art, these books, some of which contain uh, what I would think is sensitive information uh, about the American government and about Western governments. But it seems to me that probably by the time they write these books, um, in which they are revealing some of the uh, tactics which are used by America and Britain and the rest of the Western nations. I think by the time that they write these books, uh, these countries have already moved on to new tactics and we continue to talk about the old tactics and so maybe we can learn uh, something there. But I think we need to be mindful that these countries may have already moved on. Okay, so it's written all of these books, uh, War, Foreign Policy, Rex Tillerson, Silver Linings Playbook, Don't Build Donald Trump's, Don't Build Trump's Wall, Amend the Constitution. So he's written all of these, these books. I don't know whether they are books or they are just, let me click on one, see what it is. Oh, these are just the articles that he has written. Okay. So these are articles that he has written. And I'm going to go back here. I'm going to go back here. Uh, so he wrote this in December 2015. And he starts by saying that in one of Africa's most celebrated surprises this year, Nigerian voters unseated President Goodluck Jonathan. The election of Mohamedou Buhari defied expectations of electoral fraud and violence and his anti-corruption platforms sparked hopes for reform and economic growth. Okay, so here is a guy who is promising re uh, reform and economic growth. Okay, so is Nigeria's economy half empty or half full? Photographer Pius told me. So Nigeria needs a new start. Nigeria's new president, Mohamed Buhari, who takes off his Friday made history by not notching the first defeat of an incumbent president since independence in 1960. Now comes the hard part. Getting Africa's biggest economic dynamo restarted. So Nigeria, they, they are swapping places with, with South Africa in becoming the, the biggest uh, economy in, uh, on the African continent. But uh, 
we can see that there are so many problems associated with the Nigerian economy as well as the South African economy. We saw how South Africa was downgraded to junk status. Uh, this is something we can talk about in another video. But so um, why was this significant, the election of uh, Buhari? Now, um, so into Africa is another article which was uh, written by Gina uh, Spierlek and Jeff Kanz in 2016 of September. Uh, Africa has long been a battlefield for world powers. So we're looking at the Chinese and the United States. Um, they, uh, they are trying to win the Africans. So here's the situation. China, China's investments in sub-Saharan Africa have grown 40-fold since 2003 and have been made in every country on the continent, building things like hydroelectric dams, highways to oil regions, and railways to carry iron ore. So it looks like what, so what um, the Chinese are doing is they are building the sort of infrastructure which they need in order to loot the, from the African continent. So they will build highways to oil regions. Now, why would you build a highway to an oil region? Because you want to be able to take the oil from the oil region. And why would you build railways uh, to where the iron ore is? Because you want to carry um, the, the iron ore yourself. Why would you build uh, hydroelectric dams? Because they need to use the power as well in order to help themselves to take resources from Africa. So here is one, one other thing that the Chinese have done. So the China, China's government joined with the Africa Development Bank to create the $2 billion Africa Growing Together Fund. While Chinese companies have been criticized for importing Chinese labor rather than training and employing locals, they are now building garment and uh, manufacturing plants to take advantage of Africa's cheap labor amid high unemployment. U.S. development in Africa has been uh, private sector driven and concentrated in a few countries like, including Liberia, Mauritius, and South Africa. Okay. So that's the situation we have. This is, this graph is showing uh, the total exports and imports with each partner. So with China, this is what uh, trade with South Sahara and Africa has been doing. So they started off in the year 2000. So in the last 14 years, it has really grown. Uh, and the China has surpassed America in that about 2009, 10, they surpassed America. And we are now at about $140 billion uh, worth of exports and imports. And then the, 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 the Americans have gone down since 2011 uh, from about a high of $9 billion, $90 billion rather, to about uh, 40, maybe $42, 43000000000 billion. Uh, in ex in in exports and imports, okay. So let me just close that one and going back to my original article. So this is my original article. So yet progress on both fronts. Uh, okay, let's go back to here. Yet progress on both fronts. We need to go back to that. Yet progress on both both fronts has been slow and uneven. To understand why, so Tom Burgess has written this book, The Looting Machine, and you can find it on Amazon. Uh, the hard copy is, the hard cover is uh, $8.11, the paperback $11.54, and the audio CD is $24.68, but I'm just going to buy the audio. Uh, iOS version, which is about eight British pounds, about eight pounds, nine pounds. So he talks about the looting machine, uh, 
and by the looting machine is referring to the to the Chinese uh, most prominently. Okay, so that is the book, a bracing look at why a continent blessed with one third of the world's hydrocarbon and mineral wealth remains mired in poverty and dysfunction. Okay, so. He's a former foreign correspond, uh, correspondent for the Financial Times, and uh, he goes beyond the tales of spectacular banality. Among Africa's big men, the world's four longest serving rulers are in African countries, bursting with oil or minerals. And he explains how the continent's resource curse is sapping the development of Africa. So, Nigeria is an example. It's Africa's biggest oil producer, gets more than 90% of its foreign earnings and two-thirds of its tax revenue from oil experts, exports. Yet there are many reasons why that hydrocarbon bounty is a mixed blessing. So the oil that they have is a mixed blessing because that money is not doing what it's supposed to do. Okay, So they are the biggest uh, oil producer and they were planning to pump uh, in 2016, Nigeria to pump 2.4 million barrels of oil daily in 2016. Okay. Country to pursue low cost production with low oil levels. Nigeria to seek new funding models for its oil joint ventures. So they are doing these oil joint ventures with external investors, which means that there is something in it for the external investors. And what does the external investor bring? They probably bring machinery. They probably bring in money, uh, money to pay the workers and stuff like that. But they also get uh, the oil. And they then the Nigerians get to buy the oil when it's been processed as uh, fuel, as petrol, as diesel. Uh, even car tires are made from crude oil. There is a host of products byproducts of the fractional distillation of crude oil, which the countries which take this oil benefit from, car tires, uh, the building of tired roads, uh, most of the parts of the engine of a car, all of those are byproducts of the processing of crude oil. Okay, so Nigeria plans to pump 2.4 billion million barrels of oil per day in 2016 as it pursued low cost production to offset revenue losses from falling crude oil, crude prices. Okay, so they're actually producing more when the prices are low, but they're not asking the question of why has the price of the barrel of crude oil fallen? And why are they producing more? Because they are going to get less money, okay, because the, the barrel price has fallen, which means they are producing more to offset the loss in revenue because they've been selling them for more. So now that they have gone cheaper and they are not in control, they own the oil, but they don't determine the prices. And so when the Americans decide that they want more oil, they drop the price of the oil and buy more oil for less money. So, uh, Emmanuel Kachiku said, we must bring down substantially the cost per barrel of oil in this industry. Now, um, why he wants the price of a barrel of oil to come down so that they produce more and they lose more oil uh, defies imagination. So in an era of declining price of oil, it's going to be very essential that we're able to produce the most competitive oil in the market. We must be the lowest cost producer. Okay, so they are going to come up with um, investors who are going to promise them low cost production, but there is no guarantee that the production is going to be low cost. Africa's biggest oil producer depend on exports of the commodity for more than 90% of its foreign earnings and two-thirds of government revenue. So government gets its revenue, two-thirds of it, from uh, the export of oil, okay? And the economy, uh, foreign currency earnings 
amount to nine percent. Uh, it amount to nine percent is from is from the export of oil. Okay, a sixty eight percent drop in the price of Brent oil from its 24, 2014 peak has seen government revenue plummet. So they are getting less money because they've been relying on this. So that is the problem that when you've got such a good commodity and you rely on it for your exports, and so your foreign currency is dependent on it, it means that if there's a fluctuation, and I'm reminded of what happened in Zambia at some point, where Zambia was export, exporting copper and was getting revenue from copper, then suddenly the market was flooded with cheap copper and Zambia suffered because the price of copper dropped and their revenues also dropped uh, from the exports of, of that. So it's the same thing which is happening to Nigeria. They are having to produce more and yet they are getting less money from it. Okay, so Nigeria is determined to refund its, its oil revenues. We can't sell the refineries in their current state because there will be sold as scrapes. So we have a problem there. Okay, going back to my article. Um, for starters, it can drive up the value of the nation's currency. So this is the problem with having a resource like oil. Okay, it can, what it, what, what it does is drive up the value of the nation's currency. Okay, and it makes other exports less competitive and imports more attractive. So if it makes imports more attractive, what that means is that the country is using its foreign currency earnings to import other stuff. So that you get foreign currency from out, outside the country as revenue for your oil. And then you return that money because you want to buy the latest cars from Germany. So you are returning that money to where it has come from, which means ultimately you lose the oil and you also lose the money. And then you get a product like a Mercedes Benz, okay, which is going to deteriorate in value the moment that it leaves the workshop. So the moment that it leaves Germany, its price has dropped. You cannot return it a day later and get the same and return it for the same amount. It has gone down. It is now an item which has been bought. So whoever is buying it uh, after that is buying a second hand item because it has already been purchased by someone else. Okay. So it drives up the value of nation currency. The oil does. And then the other exports become less competitive, which means you're getting less from the other, um, from the other exports. You're getting less money from the other exports. And then you're importing more. Okay. As Burgess points out, textiles used to be Nigeria's most important manufacturing industry. But cheaper Chinese imports smuggled in by Nigerian gangs. Can you imagine that Chinese imports, which are cheaper, are destroying Nigeria's textile industry? And it is not the Chinese who are bringing them in. It is the Nigerians who are bringing them in. It is the Nigerian gangs who are bringing them in. Okay. An illicit trade worth more than two billion a year have devastated the industry. One example of why Africa produces just one and a half percent of global manufacturing output, despite the abundance of cheap labor. So we've got all this cheap labor, but we're not using the cheap labor to produce more. Only one percent, one and a half percent of global manufacturing output. That is just not good enough. It means we're importing more than we are exporting okay we import almost everything and zimbabwe there's a joke that we import even boxes of matches which is really embarrassing to say the least okay so billions of dollars in oil revenues are also a tempting pot of money for banned politicians so we've got a problem with politicians who are now using this revenue okay to engineer their way to reverse and reverse engineer their way back into office at any election. So one 2012 report said corruption had swallowed up 37 billion 
dollars worth of Nigeria's oil money over the last decade, that surpasses the annual economic output of more than half the nations in Africa, as well as Nigeria's annual federal budget. So you can see how the billions of dollars in oil revenue is tempting politicians to be corrupt. Okay, next one. Such corruption has other toxic effects, dirty money from bribes and kickbacks has to be laundered. And because of those doing the cleaning, don't care so much about profit or productive investment. These intuitions of cash destroy the value of assets. Okay, Nigeria's horrors and hopes. Okay, so there was another article written about that. Nigeria's horrors and hopes. It's easy to write off Nigeria as a place destined to squander the potential of Africa's largest population also. Under successive governments, corruption has flourished, poverty has increased, and religious rivalries have festered. So we have a problem with corruption. We have a problem with uh, religious extremism. Since 2014, the year Nigeria of tempor temporarily overtook South Africa to become Africa's largest economy, it has been crippled by the crash in crude prices and a renewed bombing campaign by militants targeting oil pipelines. Oh, you can see what's happening here. Okay, there is hope and there is horror. All because of the oil, there is instability, there is Boko Haram, there is uh, piracy attacks, there is uh, ethnic ethnic uh, disagreements which is really a shame for a country which is actually overtaken South Africa but because of the drop in oil it is actually uh, been surpassed again by South Africa but I don't know because now South Africa uh, has also gone through the uh, credit rating to junk status, so we don't know what that's going to do to its economy. So Nigeria's reliance uh, on oil for tax revenues also creates a perverse political dynamic. As Pegis puts it, the ability of rulers of Africa's resource state to govern without recourse to popular consent, which means, basically, that African countries no longer need the vote uh, to determine whether or not they stay in power because they've got access to resources, they have accumulated enough money to rig uh, an election. And rigging is not necessarily stuffing ballot boxes, but it's, it's buying the vote because they have become so wealthy. And without money, the opposition is at the mercy of, of the ruling party especially those that have been in power for a very long time, which makes it really difficult for an opposition to come into power because they don't have the money uh, to finance the election. So instead of having to do right by taxpayers to win their votes, which is why we really don't have uh, an economic debate, because they are not interested in the debate, because they don't need the economy. Look at Zimbabwe. The economy is on its knees, but Zanu PF is still in power. So, despite uh, having an economy on its knees, Zanu PF is still able to stay in power because they've got the money. They can finance their stay in power. So, they no longer need to uh, prove to the electorate that they are the right people to run the country. They can just buy themselves back into power. So, Politicians focus on controlling and dispensing mineral wealth to bol bolster their patronage networks. So they build these networks of, they know the people that can keep them in power. So they finance these people. And these people uh, are the propaganda machine that keeps, keeps them in power. So politics become a game of mobilizing was ethnic brethren. Okay. Pages notes a contest with dangerous destabilizing effects in Nigeria's fractious polity. In fact, as one of Nigeria governor explained, if you fail to share the world, ill gotten or otherwise, I've got a big political enemy. See? 
So uh, having money is just enough for you to mobilize people. In Zimbabwe, we've seen how it's easy to buy uh, the youth uh, scads of beer. During election time, they drink, they become rowdy, they harass the opposition. And after the election, life goes back to normal. But the election has been won. So Nigeria is far from exception. At least 20 African countries are what the International Monetary Fund calls resource-rich. So it means that their natural resources um, account for more than a quarter of exports. So Zimbabwe is an example um, because of its diamond deposits. The Republic, the DRC and Guinea are other examples of resource-rich nations. Okay. So even as the names of historians, histories of the different predator uh, leaders blur, one thing is clear. Their looting depends on an all too willing cast of outside partners, whether Western mining and oil companies that plunked down bribes and abetted massacres, shady Israeli middlemen or shell companies in the British Russian Islands. So the success of the uh, leadership failure okay, in Africa is not isolated, but it, it's, um, they are working together with, with, Western, with their Western partners and also uh, offshore, com offshore uh, countries like the British Virgin Islands. So um, there is a case in point of, for example, it says here, particularly describing his pages description of the unsavory role played by the World Bank's IFC, which begs visibly corrupt, environmentally destructive. Uh, we've seen how for example, the Chinese are being environmentally destructive. Uh, in Norton, Temba Mliso was on, on, on video uh, showing us how the Chinese have, uh, have um, not fixed the roads where they're operating. But if you think about it, they are not doing it in isolation. The government of the day is allowing them to do that. Okay. So the same thing in Ghana, in Guinea, in, uh, in Chad, the same thing is happening. Destruction of the natural environment. Then there is this guy called uh, San Pa, Samuel Pa, the speckled bearded Zelig behind some of the continent's most dubious recent resource deals. Okay, so he's quite notorious. Uh, he owns a company called the 88. Queen's uh, Way Group is under U.S. Treasury sanctions. Uh, Western criticism of China's growing presence in Africa Vegas rights nonetheless carries a distinct whiff of hypocrisy that might make even King Leopold blush. Moreover, ordinary Africans tend to gain much from the one trillion dollars or so that Chinese entities will reportedly plow into their continent by 2025. So it reminds me of how much the World Bank and the IMF have poured into Africa since the 60s. It's also uh, more than a trillion dollars, but uh, we have not seen anything. With China, we're going to see a lot of infrastructure development, but most of the infrastructure, I'm afraid, helps China to get what they want because they are building a railway line which is going straight to the resources that they want. They are building isolated uh, um, airports, small airports in areas where they can, they are getting maybe diamonds or something like that, okay, and flying them straight out of Africa. So I think that's what we're going to see more of. Um, that said, the tale of Pa and Queensway, which has its tentacles wrapped around all holdings in Angola and Nigeria, diamond mines in Zimbabwe, and agriculture in Mozambique, to name just a few of its ventures, reeks of sulfur and brimstone, as several seasoned African mining executive told Burgess. The Queensway group reminded them of Sisu John Rhodes, the forerunner. 
uh, of those who use the conquest of natural resources to advance political power and vice versa. So not only is SENPA doing that, but uh, African governments are doing the same. Okay, they are using natural resources to advance political power. Okay, one of the biggest hopes, based hope for curbing this capacity and corruption may be to impose greater transparency on Africa's outside business partners. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Information, for instance, recently proposed a rule requiring oil list, U.S. listed oil, gas, and mining companies to public details of their payments to government. So how much are they paying them and for what? I think that's a positive move by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. But obviously, it's an exchange for something. They also get uh, something out of whoever they're making those deals with. Um, even China may see the writing on the wall. So Sun Pai has been... Um, has been um, involved in anti-corruption probing by the Chinese government after this article, for example. So, yes, this is what is happening uh, in Africa. And hopefully we can be, we are becoming uh, more and more aware of what is happening. And so we can we can stop some of this uh, this this functional uh, society and allow Africa to to rise because it's not rising because of this corruption. The minerals are are being mined. The oil is being is is, is being drilled, but we're not benefiting from the oil. We're not benefiting from the mine. So this is something that we need to discuss going forward okay thank you for listening i'll see you in the next video